Hello everyone and welcome to the 8th Digital Europe Economic Center. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Chela gomez Ferreira of the University of Balearic Island. Uh, Dr. gomez Ferreira has previously worked at the European Commission's Joint Research Center on topics related to the EU digital single market in areas ranging from media regulation and cultural diversity to platform work and gig economy. Her current work centers on the effects of digitization on economy and society with a focus on online labor market platforms. She is also a member of the Excellence Network for the Future of Work and Inclusive Growth. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to have approximately uh, 35, 40 minutes uh, of presentation, right? And followed by time for questions. You can also ask questions along the way. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the nice uh, presentation. And, yeah, as you have already said, this is, a, this is an exploratory. Uh, I see Andrea Herman in the audience. Ah, nice to see you again. Uh, <laughs> so, this project started as a request from Russell's, actually. Well, not this specific paper, but uh, this, this full uh, set of papers that we have done on online labor markets. And, each one has a different idea. In, in, in this specific paper, we explore the, the artificial intelligence uh, presence and how it, it, it is present or not in online level markets, and then the market power uh, dynamics in this type of labor markets. Uh, this is a joint work with Nestor Bill Brown, Frank Muller, and Song Will Dolan. They are from the Commission and Max Planck Institute. And uh, okay, so first, a figure. Uh, do you see the screen, right? Okay, so first motivating figure, this is uh, this is the online labor index. This is created by Oxford Internet Institute. And it's it, 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 it compiles the project posted in the top five online level platforms, which are uh, Upwork, Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, People Power, and some others. And it shows that this, this type of the labor market has grown around 70% over the past five years, which is a first motivating uh, uh, fact for this project. So the, the growing importance of this type of markets is obvious. And it is also actually very relevant from policy perspective. There's, there's several actions that Europe has taken to regulate or at least understand this type of phenomenon. So that's one of our motivations in this paper. Then the second, is related to AI, which is, uh, of course, uh, having a, acquiring a global importance, a growing low, um, economic importance, as you probably are aware of. And, and there's a lot of things starting and related to AI, but there are not so many things uh, from an empirical perspective. So this was another motivation for this paper. And we think the main motivation is that we think that both phenomena are interrelated. So. Uh, on the one hand, the, the new internet developments lead to advancement in AI. And on the other hand, this new type of research and or this type of technologies uh, allow for a new type of work, that is freelancing uh, specifically, we explore freelancing here. So we think that there's a connection between the both, both phenomena. So we explore this in this paper. And we also want to look at the seats in labor market dynamics and market power that these two things may provoke. So this is the motivation. Then this is related to main, four main strands of literature. So first, market power and firm level labor plasticity. Here maybe our reference paper is Asar my next one is uh, which, uh, This is a very good paper, actually. Then this is also related to demand wages uh, and demand and wages for AI labor. There are not so much empirical evidence on this, and we present some facts related to this. Then, of course, the paper from Green Holson, or however this surname is pronounced, on the impact of AI on labor markets. And, and finally, of course, there's a lot of paper which is which are in our interest related to the regulation of this type of evidence. So what we do in the paper, very briefly, what we do is to investigate three alternative indicators of market power, which are labor demand elasticity, labor supply elasticity, and concentration of market shares. 
and we use an IV approach that I will present. And finally, we also have during the sample period an exogenous exchange in the platform conditions that allow us to, to identify some, some, some facts. So this is what we do. How we do this, I will present our data set. So this data set comes from a company which is included in this OLI index that I've presented at the very beginning. It is called People Power, is one of the uh, biggest platform. It's the top platform actually in Europe, located in Europe. So the top platform for online level market is Upwork. I don't know if you, if you know this platform or not, but it is the, like the biggest in the world. And then the biggest in Europe is People Power. It's included in this, it's one of the top five uh, worldwide. It has around 1.4 million members globally. And the sample that we have come direct, directly from them. We, we have collaborated with them in several projects, and this is one of them. And it includes daily data for from the period November 2014 to October 2016. And each observation, each observation in this data set is a proposal. So I will maybe uh, explain very briefly how the platform works. So in this platform, uh, I give an employer goals and post a project. For instance, I want this text to be translated or I want this web page to be created. And then he or she receives a number of proposals from the worker side. And finally, both employer and worker agree on a single uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a single price and the project starts. So that this is how it works, this, this platform and most of the online platforms. And we have, so every observation in our data set is a proposal. We have data from 175,000 employers, 420,000 projects, and, and 106,000 uh, workers. And this is for 180 countries in this worldwide platform. We have several characteristics that you can see here. But essentially, we have everything that is included in the, in the web page. And, and some things which are not in the web page, for instance, the price, the agreement price. So this is the data set. Then we, for to identify AI, what we do is to identify AI within this database to, to understand how, how is the proportion of AI projects that we have in the sample. And for this, we constructed a list of keywords that is based on Rigi et al. And after that, after that, we extended this with the help of a group of machine learning researchers from the commission. And then, by using this list of keywords, which is actually this one here that you can see here, uh, uh, we match this list with the data set that we have to identify which are AI projects and which are AI workers and, and employers. So that's essentially the data that we use. How is it structured? What is the policy change that we have? Uh, it's, it's, uh, so in this platform, when employer goes and posts a project, and project they can specify or not the budget they are willing to pay. So the price they are, um, it's an orientative price, it's not binding, but they can say, for instance, I want this text translated for 100 euros. That's an example. Or they can leave a blank space. And then they can also indicate the experience level required to perform the project, that it can take three values and three intermediate and an expert. So the change is actually that the second mechanism was not available before August 15, which is in the middle of the observation uh, period. So before this date, the only mechanism that they had to reveal the willingness to pay was the budget here, the first year. And then after this, uh, this date, the second mechanism became compulsory. So the first one is still uh, optional, but for the employers, the second, um, the gain complexity. So we think this change is important because it somehow reduces the asymmetry of information that we typically have in these markets. That's why we think this is an interesting change. This is how it looks like. So when the employer go and, and, and post a project, he or she can choose one of these three uh, levels, which is something that afterwards appear in the, this is what the workers see when they go to the platform. So in the upper part of the slide, you can see that when the employer decided, decides not to reveal the budget, they, then workers don't see anything about the, about the project. Whereas in the second case, in the lower part of the slide, you can see that they at least have the, 
the, the indication whether this is one, two, or three dollar signs indicating the difficulty, which is also when you click on the project, what you see here in the lower part of the slide. Okay, so this is the change that we use for identification and the, the data sets. You have any doubt, you can, of course, ask. And now I will present the, the, the empirical structure. So the first thing we want to look at in this project is AI artificial intelligence demand and labor demand elasticity. So we define demand as the number of projects posted by each employer, market, and month. Of course, here we don't have uh, geographical markets, so there's no geographical segmentation. But there are some segmentation associated to the experience level required for a project and the subcategory of the project. So we have, in total, there are 96 subcategories. So we define a market by each, <coughs> sorry, experience level and subcategory. And then we define an AI employer as an employer who has at least 10% of the project in the past uh, that are AI, AI projects. We do a lot of sensitivity analysis for this. So we, we have a set of different thresholds for, for this measure. Results are quite consistent. And then, of course, this is a, a demand equation. So we have a price. The price is given by the average budget that a given employer posts in the market in a month. And, and of course, since it's a demand equation, we have endogeneity concerns. So that's why we use an, an IV. In this case, the ID that we use is a sitter from the supply side. And then instead of, um, this is a bit tricky, but it's, it's quite obvious actually. So instead of using the budget that the employer posts, what we do is to measure the average expected wage, sorry, that workers in this market, in the same market, uh, but proportion to all the projects, uh, the, expected that they, the expected wage that they declare on their profile. So. Maybe this I didn't uh, explain, but every worker here has a profile, and in the profile they 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 declare an expected wage per hour that they want to to have. It's not binding. Again, they can afterwards bid at a higher or lower amount. But we think this is a good proxy for the workers' reservation wage, and then it's a good instrument for the for the price in this demand equation. So we had a number of results. You will find more results in the paper, but here I wanted to focus only on two. First interesting result that we have is AI employer posts more projects. This is a, a first interesting uh, result. And then second, the not, so this variable here is the after policy change, is the it takes value one after the policy change, the change that the platform implemented. And then, so what this coefficient here is saying us is that the number of job postings increased after the policy change. And also, this is a okay. Well, so but the the thing is that the elasticity of demand changed after the policy change. This is the second interesting result that we that we have here with respect to demand. Now, in the second step, we also explore uh, a supply. So this is our equation for supply here. We define supply as the number of worker proposals that a project receives. So not necessarily only the winning proposals. It, it may happen that, for instance, if I go and post, I want to create a web page, then I may receive eight, eight proposals from eight different workers. So this eight is our dependent variable here. The number of proposals, this is at the project level. And the, and the number of proposals that a, that a project receives, this is the the measure that we use for supply. Again, we have a dummy for a project being AI or not. And we have a price variable, which is the budget. And again, of course, we have endogeneity concerns. So in this case, the ID that we use comes from the literature is, is proposed by Duberol in 2018 in an AER paper. And it's called monopsony, or we call this variable monopsony. It comes, so the, the good thing of this variable is that it is a sifter from the demand side. So in each case, we try to use a sifter from the other side of the market. And it is the tendency, it, it takes this monopsony value, takes val uh, variable takes value one, when the employer has the tendency to choose a round number for a given budget. So this is more clear with an image, I think. 
For instance, here, when we explore the data, we realize that there are uh, this tendency to put budgets at a round number, 10, 20, 30, whatever. We have three, three currencies, but it's the same for the three. So this is our proxy for, for price in the supply operation, something that should not affect, uh, um, should affect the price, but should not affect the, the supply. So this is the instrument, this is the specification, and these are the results that we find here. So in mo most interesting finding that we have here is the first that AI project received uh, between 1.6 and 6.8 fewer bits than non-AI projects. So as compared to non-AI project, the, the supply is, is lower. That's interesting. So we had higher demand, but lower supply. It is, this is for us is an indicator of, of skill shortage or some, at least there's some lack of supply in the market, in the AI market, which is uh, surprising, but not so surprising if we think in the speed that this change has, has had over the last year. So it's it's like the reskilling is not it's not enough for it anymore. This is a, a too strong con conclusion for only this position, but it is a the intuition. Then a second interesting result is that a uh, project posted after the policy change. So this one over here is again our exogenous shock. This type of this project posted after this received more project. The intuition for this is that the this uh, better explain in the paper, but I don't want to uh, go much into the details here. But the intuition is that the policy change, since reduced it reduced the asymmetry of information in the platform, it created a better functioning. So it, it is creating a better sorting of proposals and, and projects, because one of the problems in this type of platform is the huge amount of information that you have. Uh, information, uh, sorry, I mean, uh, workers or or proposals that, um, that an employer receives. So by this policy change, somehow the, the efficiency of the platform was improved and the and the work supply increased. This is our interpretation of this of this sign here. And then with respect to the uh, elasticity, we found that the we find that the labor supply elasticity decreased after the policy change. So this is another interesting uh, finding that we have here. And then the third set of results is related to market concentration. In this case, we uh, we use the or we replicate somehow the analysis from Asarma and Espen Steinman, which is the, probably the seminal paper on this. And they use a HHI index to uh, to measure the market power of employers. So again, we define market in the same way. Here we don't have the so the market definition in this. Uh, um, the question is quite important, but we don't have, they have, they do as at all, they have a physical market. They do this for a physical labor market. This is digital, but again, we define the market in the same way by jobs, job subcategory and experience level required. And uh, so the main finding here is that uh, there's no robust evidence for a negative effect of market concentration on agreed price, prices. So in this case, price is the dependent variable, price of, of the project this is at the project level. And for all, sorry, maybe this I didn't explain, but in all tables, we do subsequent specification, including subsequent set of fixed effects or control variables. But in all specification, we don't find any uh, evidence of negative impact of market concentration on agreed prices, which is surprising. I mean, it's not the typical finding, and that's maybe uh, this is not AI related, but we thought this is interesting because it's related to market concentration and market power. And it somehow shows that digital markets are, are not so uh, subject to, to this market concentration, which is good. Then we also had this interesting finding that uh, AI employers pay higher prices. We do a, a second or an expansion of this result. We explore this because this is at the project level. Then the side thing that we do is to explore this for projects. So it is obvious maybe that uh, AI employers pay higher wages. And of course, AI projects receive higher wages. So in this case, we only include mini proposals. 
So it's a very similar analysis actually, but we wanted to confirm the finding. It's just, we think it's an important finding, the, the finding that AI projects are better paid than, than non-AI projects. So these three things are essentially the, the results of the analysis, which are the main caveats of this, uh, of, of, of this analysis. First, we don't have, this is of course for all the papers, the same, the same problem, but I don't think there's a solution for this. There's no information about the other options of the workers in the platform when they act outside the platform. So it's very difficult to, to of course, it's, we don't have any information of their behavior outside. And it would be really interesting because we don't, we still don't know, or it's not clear in the literature whether these are complementary or substitution of, of traditional labor. So that would be really interesting, but we don't, we don't have that information. Another potential problem, even if we did a lot of, lot of uh, sensitivity analysis and we use uh, different keywords and so on, but the, it may happen that we are underestimating the presence of AI because the identification of AI comes from the self-reported text that the, the employers declare on their profiles. So it could be that we are not detecting all the AI projects that, that we really have in the platform. That's the second caveat. So main conclusions for, for, this, um, for this project. First, we find evidence for a higher demand for AI-related labor and a lower supply of AI-related uh, labor as compared to all the types of labor. So this is um, in combination with the second fact which is that AI projects receive higher wages than non-AI projects. These two things uh, lead us to think about a job seeker, evidence for a job seeker market for AI experts. So we think that there's still higher, uh, there's this gap between the skills that we need or, or the type of talent that we need and the, and the talent that we have in the market. So there's still room for growth on the supply side. And then another interesting finding that we, we think that this is an interesting finding, uh, the, the policy change, this is actually interesting for another set of policy reasons. The policy change is implemented by the platform. Uh, it's self-regulated in a way the platform is self-regulating because it's designing to reduce the information, the, the asymmetry of information without any external. So this is something that they, they, on their own initiative, they do. And it affects actually the dynamics of labor supply and demand in this market. And consequently, it affects the distribution of market power. And oil. So this is, uh, this is an interesting finding that could, could set some line on, the, on how this platform could, could self-regulate themselves or not. So this is the second main main finding in the paper. As I've said, we have some other findings and other facts that you could find in the paper, but I didn't want to bore you. So this is this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, I think we already have a question. Uh, so please go ahead. I see a hand raised by uh, Andrea Herman. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, it was just clapping, but I also <laughs> <laughs> so Estrella, very nice to see you after these years. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're a bit more back to research now, it seems. Um, yeah, back <laughs> to the good life. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we just catch up online at some point, like over email or so. And um, I just have um, two questions. The one is so artificial intelligence you define like just as the skill that is searched for, right? Yeah. Okay, um, so I was, I think I was wondering is what is your specific interest? So why do you look at artificial intelligence and not, at, yeah, exactly. So not at um, something like um, Python or another language, because here artificial intelligence basically is just listed as a skill. Mm -hmm. um, so, so is there a specific reason to look for that skill as compared to other skills um, that are also now in high, high demand? And um, the second uh, point that I was wondering, and also when looking at this list, is when you go to these web pages today, 
what has been 80 categories or 84 skills like five years ago now is hundreds of skills. So they have extremely branched out in terms of the skills that can be requested and that are in demand. I'm also, I mean, I'm, I'm working with freelancer, as you know, but I mean, I guess the same will be the case for people per hour. So to what extent do you have any insights that what you find five years ago is still applicable today? Because these markets are only in yeah. years old. So can you say something about the applicability of these findings, which are in view of the overall time of the market already a little bit older to today's markets, in view of how they have also changed in terms of skill development and stuff? Sure, yeah. So thank you for the question. So first, we focus on AI because it was a specific request from, from the commission. And, and we, in, in additional projects, we are like exploring not only AI, but other related like things that could facilitate AI, even if they are not directly AI, for instance, this Python or other digital skills, which are not classified as AI specifically. But at the first step, the commission was interested in on the AI aspect. So that's why we started this in this way. We still uh, uh, working on that on a set on several side projects just to, to explore other things. But but th that's the reason why we here focus on AI. And then there is it's, it's completely true. So the five years in this in this field is already a lot. So actually we are this is the results that we have for now. And that's why I presented this. And then in a second project, we are expanding the data set as of today. So we are trying to, it's not that easy because sometimes negotiating with the platform, they are very, very reluctant to, to give us the data. So there are some problems associated with this. They are also afraid of the commission because they think we can start regulating them. <laughs> but but now we have the, expans the expanded data set ending in 2020, I think. So we will check whether this is still whether this is still valid. So this is an ampliation of the of the paper somehow. Thanks a lot, Estrella. I'm sorry I will leave the meeting because I have the next one at 1.30, but it was wonderful sure. again. And let's just catch up over email then. Sure, of course. Good nice night. to see you. Bye. Ciao, thank you. Thank you. Do, do we have other questions? Well, I have a few, if I may. Um, I wanted to ask, so, 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 so as I understand you, you focus on like two things here. Like well, one is whether something is an AI project and the second is the effect of the policy. Uh -huh. And would you, Affect the policy to, for example, somehow differently affect the AI project? Uh, have you looked at this or? Yeah, actually, that's something we intensively explore because this was, uh, honestly, this was one of the questions from a referee. Uh, the, there's kind of a lack of connection between the two, but it's, we don't find anything that is different for AI than for non AI. We don't observe a different behavior. Okay, so even if you like, I mean, interactions or restrict to AI projects like the, the yeah. outcome are pretty much the same for all. Yeah, it's the AI. same. There's nothing specific about AI in, in this, in the sense of, so there's something different in uh, demand, supply, elasticities, and prices, but not with respect to, to the policy change. Yeah, that was some of the news. Okay, that's interesting. I, th I thought that maybe this policy could have a larger effect for AI projects where it might be more important to distinguish between the levels. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. I was also suspecting that, but it seems not to be the case. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, so, do you do you what was there a change like in the well did the policy possibly affect the number of employers as well or the number of workers perhaps do yes. you 
when you calculate the like the number of projects per employer and you do this analysis, do you focus on the like the same set of employers who were before and after the policy, or does the number of employers change actually? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, we haven't explored that. We had another paper on network effects and the and, and but it's disconnected to the policy change. But actually, it could be interesting to explore whether this policy change had a had an impact on the number of users on its on its side. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. Okay. This, I've been wondering if you know if, if there were new employers who entered after the policy, might, they might differ on the number of projects they post right. or something like that. Right, uh, right. I'm, I'm not sure if you uh, included the. Uh, we have day fix effects and employer fix effects, anyways. Okay. It should capture this, but, but it would be interesting to look at the raw data to see. Okay. Um, and last thing I was, in, I was curious about is um, at the start you mentioned that these uh, workers and employers come from lots of different countries. And mm -hmm. um, is the is there like a, is it spread more or less evenly, or are there any countries that dominate this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm wondering also because you mentioned that you don't know anything about what they do outside of the platform, mm -hmm. and maybe the, there could be some regional differences that could be exploited here if there's enough people from you know all the different countries, mm -hmm. uh, at least at the level where you, where you could see, for example, if there are many job opportunities uh, where they where they are to exploit, right. for example, AI skills or whatever. Or is there no job market for the for those skills where they come from? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Also, we didn't explore that. So there's there's a like a pattern in the employers country. Top ten employers country are uh, U.S., U.K., and some European countries. And then top ten worker countries are actually India, Bangladesh, and this this. Uh, so there's this difference. This is also a common finding, I think, for other online labor markets. This is typically the case, so which has a lot of implication for competition and, and wages and all these type of things. But it's true, this could give us some variation at the country, at the country level, on the level of AI skills in each country. But yeah, that's that's a good point. Do you think that the policy could change? Uh like the distribution of the countries of the applying workers? Mm, I mean, I the sense I don't that... expect so, but... Okay, yes, yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if, you know, if the distribution of experts and intermediate levels, et cetera, is equal across the countries, or perhaps it's, it's unequal, which yeah, is also... Right. It could be, yeah, right, right. Which could also contribute to the, these uh, price differences, probably. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's that's something to explore. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I don't have other questions. Do we have uh, other questions, perhaps? Oh well. Okay then. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank, Thank you, you for accepting the invitation. It was very interesting. And well, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll see each other at the next seminars. Sure. Let's hope after COVID we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Ciao.